Hi, it's Annie. Today I want to talk about gem tintypes. You may come across these in your travels. They're very tiny little photographs um, on metal and they're really interesting as a piece of photographic history and also they sell pretty well on eBay and elsewhere and we're going to talk about both of those things today. I'll give you a little background on the format and then I'll talk a little bit about what sells and what to look for and how to sell them. So the gem tintype is about um, one and a quarter inches high and anywhere from three quarters of an inch to one and a quarter inch wide. Here's one with a ruler for scale. Uh, the, ma the vast majority of tintypes of this size are going to be portraits, usually head and shoulders views, and there are ones that aren't, and those get pretty interesting. We'll talk about those later. Um, and this size is known as a gem tintype or a gem, and for a while, they were super popular. They're also sometimes known as carte de visite um, tintypes because they were sometimes mounted like these ones on pieces of cardboard and used like calling cards. You could write your name on there and leave it when you paid a visit or just use it like a business card. And these are about the size of a modern business card. They're actually, um, two and a quarter by four, which is about the same. It's a different aspect ratio though. Um, in general, you'll know that they're tin types because they are made on a very thin metal substrate or backing material. It's actually not tin, it's iron, and it's coated with a sort of enamel emulsion. Um, because it's iron there, also known as ferrotypes, and some argue that's more correct, but common parlance is tintype. And this is what the backing material looks like. Because of how they're made, the color range is not that broad. Um, usually the lightest parts in a tintype are going to be a light to medium gray. They don't really ever get to pure white. And they have a kind of gray appearance overall. Um, it's far less broad color spectrum than a modern photograph. So these came out in 1856 in the US, tintypes in general. And the timeline skews a little bit later in the UK and Europe and Australia in terms of both patenting and inventing and also in terms of when they were popular. But in the US, um, the 1860s and 1870s were a real heyday for this format, especially the little guys. Um, tintypes in general were around into the 20th century, though they became more and more of a novelty as the decades wore on and other photographic techniques were available. And the later ones tend to not be gems, as the cameras that were used to make gems were fairly specific and not necessarily around in great abundance after these became less popular. So the later ones you'll find will tend to be somewhat larger. Um, interestingly, though, there's been a real revival of tintype photography in the past, I'd say, 20-25 years or so, with um, alternative process photographers relearning how to use this um, technology or technique and trying it in lots of different ways and producing some really amazing photography. It's worth, it's worth a Google if you're into contemporary photography. Um, these are just a couple examples. Go back to the past. The um, 
first gem tintypes came out shortly after the general tintypes came out about two years later in 1858 and there were several different photographers in Boston and elsewhere in New England who were inventing and patenting technology to create these at a pretty breakneck pace and lots of people came up with a lot of cool stuff and the key feature of of the gem camera was that it had multiple lenses so that a photographer could capture various images at the same time or several images at the same time and there were also even fancier models where the back of the camera which is this part here could be shifted to allow for multiple sessions of multiple lens photos on the same backing plate and this would allow for not just four or nine photos to be taken at once but essentially you know four eight sixteen thirty two to be stuck on one piece of metal or multiples of nine or however many lenses they had um, with one sitting which was a real improvement over the older techniques with one lens where each shot was an individual um, ordeal basically and, and since older techniques were longer exposures too it was getting multiple photos was um, a longer process so with a tintype the negatives well there are no negatives the photo is is um, captured right on the metal plate. There's no intermediary piece where, like in a modern photo, um, or a modern analog photo, I should say, the image is captured on a celluloid or plastic negative of some sort, and then that's taken in the dark room and light shown through it onto a different surface, generally, um, emulsion coated light sensitive paper and that piece of paper is the final image and there's advantages obviously because that negative can be used to create an infinite number of prints but the disadvantage is it's a multi-step time-consuming process whereas when you're printing straight onto the final surface it's like an instant photo so Here's what it looks like when the image is exposed onto the plate. And it's a little confusing, but tintypes are technically negatives or negative images. And when they're first developed, everything is color reversed from what you'll eventually see, just like on one of these, you know, plastic negatives you're used to seeing from the 20th century. Um, the whites are black and the blacks are white, etc. And then a chemical is poured on them. First they're developed, then a chemical is poured on them, which reverses the um, tonalities so that what you see appears to be a positive, though technically it's a negative. Um, and it's actually really interesting chemically and worth reading up on if you're interested in chemistry. I won't go into it further now. It's probably confusing enough. Um, so that's, but that's basically how they're developed. And as an aside, the um, <laughs> one of the chemicals used in this process is actually potassium cyanide, which is incredibly hazardous and poisonous so although the ones you find are probably inert at this point just don't lick them or anything so anyway though there were competing technologies to the tintype at this time even um like the daguerreotype and the ambrotype uh, tintypes were considerably cheaper and faster and more convenient and more portable and they became really accessible to the point where they could be used in things that were more or less mass-produced 
in a sort of Victorian way, like campaign buttons. Um, they could also be made into sort of cheap jewelry or keepsakes to give to your friends. And in the 1860s, they ran about 10 cents a dozen um, in the U.S. for unmounted photos, which was pretty accessible for people. They were um, cheap enough that it wasn't a big deal to go have your photo taken like it used to be. And also, because of how they're made, they're actually a lot sturdier than other forms of photography that were around at the time and survive pretty well. Um, they're, you know, because they're metal, they're sturdier than than a glass plate, and even to some degree, a cardboard or a paper-based photo, which is more um, susceptible to being wet or moldy or so forth. So at first, tintype photographers operated in studios like the other kinds of photographers who um, were using a lot of wet chemicals like the wet plate collodion process and the daguerreotypists, they, they needed to be in a place with um, water, chemicals, darkroom, etc. But tintypes could actually um, take their show on the road. So, and this is thanks to a, a gelatin emulsion that could be used instead of collodion. And it basically, you could let it dry and then store the plates and take them out with you. There was very little um, wet chemistry involved. So this process was called dry plate. Um, and here's some later photos of uh, tin type photographers out in the field. They were kind of, um, and this would be similar to how things looked. Um, you know, 60 years prior to when these photos were taken. Um, they were pretty much like Victorian instant photos. Uh, you could have your picture taken at a street fair or a carnival or at the seaside, and the photographer could just pop the plate out of the camera, develop it in a few minutes, and hand it to you. At the drying time, was really short for the few wet chemicals that were involved. And um, they were kind of like photo booths today. They were quick, they could be taken anywhere, and you got a whole pack of them instantly. And this is what a sheet of tintypes would look like, taken with a multiple camera lens and a moving back, probably, of the camera. And um, you just snip them apart with tin snips or even scissors. So now that you know a little bit about the background of gem tin types, let's talk about reselling them. So where to find them? In general, um, you'll find them at high end antique stores and antique fairs and markets, but they're going to be really overpriced for reselling. So I would hold out and look for them in more of a bulk capacity at estate sales, lower end auctions, you know, the kind where they have like lots of boxes of junk, just love those. <laughs> and um, antique malls or fairs or even flea markets where the sellers aren't big online researchers or, you know, just want to move stuff and aren't concerned with pricing each individual one inch photo at, you know, $15 or whatever. You want to try to get them in bulk, you know, pennies a piece or if it's, you know, a really amazing one, maybe pay a dollar or two. But I would not spend um, high end retail prices on on these guys because you can get them for cheaper so you'll also find them in albums um these were super popular in the um mid to late 
1800s. There's ones, and they're designed specifically for gem tin types. Um, there's lots of patents and stuff for for these kinds of things. There's ones that hold one photo per page, or four, or six, or eight, and um, I've even seen ones that are big albums that hold uh, like the larger paper CDV carte de visite photos in the front section and then have a section for tin types or gem tin types at the back. So, you know, flip through albums even if they're not these cute teeny tiny miniature ones. Um, same goes for box lots of old photos. Um, just last week I was at an auction where I looked through a huge box of photos and the majority of them, probably hundreds, were really boring wedding photos from the 40s and 50s, 1940s and 50s, like 8 by 10s probably, you know, they came from some wedding photographer's studio. Um, but tucked in the back underneath was a stash of 19th century material, including tin types and all kinds of interesting things. So just poke around. <laughs> always, always my advice and what I think is fun. So let's um, take a look at some things on eBay and get into the commercial aspect of, of this. So, okay, here's an album of gem, t gem tin types. And this is pretty typical. I have, I see these quite often sometimes. They can be had in a box lot at an auction for not very much. Um, you know, sometimes they are selling as an individual item, and um, even if it's bid up, you can still get it pretty cheap for, wh for what it is and what it can sell for. Um, so, like, this one has six uh, slots per page and in this album the majority are filled. Um, it has a sort of coffered leather um, front and back cover with some gold embossing and a metal uh, clasp or hasp to close it up. Um, it has a nice printed title page um, you know, there's a little bit of damage on the paper. It's totally typical for the age. And um, this is not impossible to find. This one sold for $175. Um, has 83 tin types in it. And I, that's what you can expect if you, um, you know, write a decent listing and find a decent album. Um, Here's another one. This one holds four tin types per page. Uh, this one only has 56 uh, photos still in it. It doesn't matter that much how many are in it as long as it's a goodly number, I find. Um, you know, they're not priced per piece as much as you might think. So, you know, this one sold for $225. Um, I think that a $100 to $200 range is not crazy for these. Um, some can sell for more than $200. Uh, I would definitely not list them as an auction. I'd list them as a buy it now and start your price pretty high and see what you can do. Um, you also, let's see, this is another teeny tiny album that is um, one one picture per page, and this one sold for 101.88 with um, kind of a weird title. <laughs> um, I don't know how many are in this one. Oh, there's only only 24 pictures in this one, so not bad. And you know, they're not. Um, Super unusual. They're quite typical, actually. You can also sell tin types in lots, not in an album. Um, actually, 
actually this one has an album but they've taken the tin types out for some reason but you can sell them without an album as well um this is 16 photos sold for 50 bucks 49 um and again these are pretty typical they're all portraits um little album that's the interior i would have um done a little bit more with what it says here um miss s hicks Bossima. yeah i would have tried to maybe sell this to someone who's related to these people by playing up the the name and address um i think people do look for their relatives in doing genealogical research and so i might have uh they didn't say anything about that what's written in the inside there um okay so there's also certain subjects that are going to go for even higher just as individuals and <laughs> what are the good subjects well as usual animals um here is a dog that sold for $156 and this is this is just a tin, uh, gem tin type it's you know an inch and a quarter high and this is a silhouette there's not even any detail although that guy looks kind of like a golden retriever if you ask me though that's actually kind of early for golden retrievers I don't know anyway um there was a really spectacular um, gem tin type of kittens on eBay sold listings earlier this week and unfortunately it's not up anymore because it sold for I think it was over $200 and it was just this teeny little photo um, of some cute kittens so definitely look out for animals always popular in pretty much any category because they're awesome um, so dogs and cats and any other animals um, also weird Victorian stuff and that's <laughs> So in that category, I would say um, stuff like this. This is sort of a hidden mother um, photo. And that term hidden mother usually refers more to like in a larger photo, they might have a mother holding the baby, but have her under a cape or cloak or piece of cloth. So you can't see her and it looks like it's just the baby floating there, except it never does. It looks like there's a mother under the cape. Um, and this was essential for earlier photo forms where you needed long exposures and the baby couldn't stay still. Um, gem tin types or tin types in general um, didn't require such long exposures. They were longer than modern photos, but they if it was bright, they were pretty quick. So you wouldn't necessarily need um, a support for the baby, except you need a support for the baby or it will fall over. So weird Victorian stuff, hidden mothers. Here we have just the arm, like, like, well, as if she's not there, except that she is. Um, so there's that. There's, um, oh, another weird Victorian thing dead kids or dead people um these are known as post-mortem photos and uh they would take pictures of their child after they died i mean since photography was so uncommon they might have no photo of their child so it wasn't that weird a thing to do but it is kind of creepy to modern tastes um this one i mean i guess it is a post-mortem it's a little hard to say but <laughs> I guess it is and so you know this this one photo sold for $43 it probably could have sold for more had they priced it higher rather than done an auction and you can see it's you know kind of creepy um other weird Victorian stuff oh that's not weird hold on oh back of the head photo this one doesn't blow up unfortunately but um victorian sometimes took pictures of 
a woman or girl's hair if it was, you know, really spectacular. Or actually, I don't really know why they would take back of the head photos, but they did sometimes. Um, so this is just a woman or girl wearing a hat and a cape and showing her sausage ringlets. Um, you know, $130. And these are not, they're uncommon, but they're not unheard of. There's lots of Victorian hair photos floating around out there. Um, so moving backwards in my tabs here. Um, where were we? So yeah, known people. Um, this is Civil War General George McClellan. And uh, $105 for this one, excuse me. Again, it might have gone for more had it not been an auction. And here's another one. Here's a General Grant. This one went for a little less. Again, maybe would have gone for more had it not been an auction. And I suspect, though I haven't researched this, that many, many photos were made of General Grant uh, because, you know, he was famous. But those are good to look out for. Um, and any soldiers are good to look out for actually even if they're not known um this one's in a nice case uh which may or may not have contributed to the price but this is a a soldier in his cap um possibly not even in uniform that looks like tweed to me but 52 dollars and um Oh, it's a union case. That's good, too. So you don't even have to know who, who the person is. Um, and where's the back of her head? Okay, another category is photos of African Americans or really any um, U.S. ethnic minorities, um, Native Americans or um, Native Hawaiians, I'm not sure who else you might find, but if you find them, that's cool. Um, so this actually is an extremely interesting photo because it looks to me like it is a photo of a photo on a gem tin type. So it's teeny tiny and it looks like it's a photograph of a larger photograph. Um, if this were mine, I would have tried to sell it just individually. Um, it in, in this case, they have some other pieces with it, which I don't think they proved were in any way related. So I think I would have tried to sell this on its own. It still did well, this lot at 127. But I think this is a super interesting piece of um, cultural and photographic history. It's a really cool photo of a photo, but the photo is cool that it's a photo of. At any rate, <laughs> um, let's hold on. Here's another one that, um, this was taken in Texas, I believe. Let's see. Texas and Arizona territory. Um, and so here's these guys in sombreros, which again is a really interesting, you know, little captured piece of cultural history. Um, I don't know, maybe they're Mexican, maybe they're from the U.S., um, but it's an interesting time and place and outfit. <laughs> um, I might have they said in this description that uh, the photography studios were named and locations, but they didn't say what those were, which I, I think would have added to this listing and maybe helped it sell higher. Um, you know, if you find a photo from the town or near the town that you're interested in or live in or have family from, uh, that can boost your interest in something like this. So 
Oops, sorry, these aren't in the right order. Oh, this, this woman is also African American, and this lot, or it's an album, comes with two photos of African American women. And, <coughs> pardon me, the uh, seller clearly knows that those are interesting and desirable, so they've called them out. Um, this is this is still for sale right now with no bid, so we'll see what happens. But I don't know. Maybe they should have pulled these out to sell separately. I'm not sure what the best way to do it is. I, I think I would have done that. Maybe lotted up these other ones since this album is in really rough shape. But, you know, we'll see what happens with this one. Okay, another topic is basically anything that is not a, fo a portrait photo. So because they're more rare, things like this could be interesting. Um, this is an architectural shot. It's just, I don't know, to me the, the foreground has such a, a Victorian feel to it, that sort of rough, undeveloped um, USA with like, you know, one finished building and then a lot of dirt roads and fences and farms. Um, it would have been amazing if they could identify this place, but that would be tricky unless it happens to be somewhere they're familiar with nearby that's still extant. Um, there are a lot of big white churches in, in New England and in the country as a whole, so um, yeah, an ID would have really boosted the price on this. Actually, this is, yeah, this sold for 50 or it's selling, or it's priced at 50 So, you know, pretty good. Um, here's another topic is anything with multiple people in it, or um, especially when there's emotion or interaction. Um, and, and this was afforded by the slower exposure or the faster exposure times for tintypes, though you don't see it that often. More, more are the more stolid look of older photos because that was what people were used to. But these are great. I mean, these guys are, it says wrestling. I, th I guess they're wrestling. At first I thought they were tying each other's ties. And, um, you know, sometimes people use a keyword gay interest for stuff like this. I don't know how I feel about that. It seems sort of, I don't know, exploitive or something, but also, you know, it could work. Um, so this one, yeah, it's $45, five bids. Not bad for something the size of a quarter. Um, what else? Okay, this is, we're getting down to the, the like lower end of the hodgepodge, but um, when you have a, an ID or you know who the person is, that's always a, a little step up from a generic tin type. Um, I tend to, um, I don't know, I usually write genealogy ID as my keyword, like genealogy ID colon and then the name. Um, having the name and the location is really great. Um, sometimes I've sold photos really fast when I've had that, people searching for their family name and, you know, place of origin. And this one, um, could use a, a little bit of a better description. Um, this one didn't have a photographer's studio, but it has um, some kind of uh, scrap of newspaper in French on the back, which is probably possible to identify, but it leads me to think that this photo is either um, French or Quebecois, and I'm or some other French-speaking part of Canada, and I'm, I'm guessing um, Canada is the most likely 
place of origin, maybe there was more context in what it was found with. I might have tried to play that up somehow if I had any hints, um, just because that makes it more interesting. I think this could have sold for a little bit more, too. Um, and then there's just your run-of-the-mill average um, gem tin type. It's going to help if the person in it is cute <laughs> or handsome or pretty. Um, like, this is just a really nice photo of a girl in a hat. So, you know, this sold for $10, $11. Not bad. Um, another one, this is, you know, the boy with freckles. Kind of cute. And $10. And then this is getting down to pretty much generic. I mean, I feel bad saying that about this fellow, but you know, he has a nice stove type hat, stove pipe hat and a goatee. He sold for about $9. This woman, this is so typical. Um, I don't think this blows up where this is, um, you know, this is your average gem tin type woman with 1860s hair and, and clothes. Um, these rouged cheeks, which they generally did just with a little bit of paint by hand. Um, this one is on sale now. And I think that it could, I don't know if it's going to go for 25 bucks, but I think it could, um, sell better with some close-ups, first of all. Oh, wait, are they down here? Nope. <laughs> um, but I think it's interesting where they come from. This is this is the uh, part of town where these first started, and you might, they could do a little research on the um, photographer, and like, here's a patent applied for, that's probably for the um, card mount. But, uh, you know, this could sell for $10 at any rate. And then, um, oh, there's our stovepipe man again. So, yeah, that's, I mean, I think that's a pretty good selection of what's out there. Um, if you find anything more interesting than all those, then that's great. They're probably worth even more. Um, who knows what's out there? If, uh, I think, like, you know, an occupational photo or people with interesting props, um, people with interesting clothes, uh people, anything that's not a straight ahead portrait, you know, people interacting, kids with toys, um, tools of the trade, landscapes, anything with a background, really, um, exceptionally handsome or cute or pretty people, um, all of those are worth, you know, sifting through your pile for and pricing a little higher. Um, but in general, even the most generic ones should be able to sell for, I'd say, like 9 to $16. Um, and they sell pretty well. At the moment, there's 281 gem tin types listed, including albums and lots, and 164 sold. So, first of all, they're not um, super oversaturated in the market. And second of all, that's a pretty good sell-through rate. Um so keep looking for those teeny tiny gem tin types because they're super cool and fun to sell. All right. Thank you.